Bismillah. Good morning. Good morning uh, in from USA and Canada, and good evening to uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening wherever you are, because we have people registered from uh, North America, from Europe. We even have few participants from Africa, and uh, of course South Asia with lots of interest. <clears throat> and it's my pleasure. I'm Suman Timsina. It's my pleasure to be a host. Uh, uh, for today, and uh, I'm representing International Development Institute, and I'm here to introduce uh, host organization and moderators for today, and they will uh, they, they are a lot more knowledgeable on subjects subject matter than I am, and they will uh, be doing 60 minutes interaction all together, and uh, the <clears throat> first the panelists will speak for a few minutes. And uh, we have received many questions when you were registering. So they will will entertain those questions with panelists. And if time permits, we will take a few questions live as well. And this event is being telecasted, uh, broadcasted live on Facebook pages of host organization, International Development Institute and uh, IMPRI. So let me just uh, go ahead and uh, introduce uh, both organization first. So uh, International Development Institute is a Washington DC based leading training and capacity building institution. And we work with private and public sectors in um, all, all the continents. And four core areas that we work is on learning and development, policy formation and advocacy, research and consultancy and institutional partnership uh, with our presence in Nepal, in India, Bangladesh, and Nigeria, Kenya, Rwanda, and United States. <clears throat> and our partner organization is New Delhi-based Impact and Policy Research Institute, IMPRI, which specializes in policy research, impact assessments, and monitoring and evaluation. The subject verticals are in comprehensive areas of economic development, governance, and the environment. Its core strength relies on network of diverse and credible research professionals from different uh, field of study and practices. And, and with this uh, difficult time, the entire world is facing with COVID. I just wanted to uh, make sure that we are all safe and we are using uh, every single precaution that and following the guidelines of whichever country we are in. And, uh, and it's a very difficult time. And, uh, there is not much uh, we can probably do other than just trying to stay safe. And uh, <clears throat> with, uh, with those notes, I'm just gonna go over some housekeeping. So some housekeeping rules are the speakers, our speakers are going to uh, keep their microphone uh, mute uh, so that there's no background noise when the other parents are speaking. And I have my colleagues in the background, uh, Arjun, Parashu and Roshan, thanks for helping us uh, in all these efforts. And I'm going to introduce our uh, panel, uh, our moderators, and then uh, moderators will come and uh, I'm gonna disappear for a few minutes and they will uh, take, uh, and you are in safe hands with them after that. And uh, first moderator I'll introduce is Dr. Ambika Adhikari. He, he has been a long time friend with us. He lives in the uh, city of Tempe, Arizona, and is a principal planner for the city of Tempe. He's heading its long range planning division. He's also a senior sustainability scientist and frequently faculty associate at Arizona State University. And he has earlier held position of uh, research professor at the university. 
He was director of international programs at DRPA Incorporate in Toronto and Washington DC, providing consulting services to projects funded by the World Bank, ADB, and Canadian International Development Agency. In Nepal, he was associate uh, professor at in Institute of Engineering at Tribun University and later country representative of IUCN, International Union of Conservation of Nature. He's a fellow of American Society of Nepalese Engineers, member of American Institute of Certified Planners, a certified lead, uh, leadership in energy and environmental design, an accredited professional and PMP. He received his Doctor of Design degree from Harvard University and Masters of Architecture from University of Hawaii. He was fellow special program at Urban and Regional Studies at MIT. He has authored one and co-edited five books related to planning, environment, and development. He has published a number of journal articles and write-ups in newspapers, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, Dr. Ambika Adhikari, and I'll introduce my other colleague who will be uh, moderator for tonight, and she is Dr. Simi Mehta. And uh, Simi is the CEO and editorial uh, director of Impact and Policy Research Institute, IMPRI. She holds PhD in American Studies from School of International Studies at JNU, New Delhi. She was Fulbright Fellow at Ohio State University in USA. She has been visiting faculty to University of Idaho, visiting researcher at uh, Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO of uh, UN Liaison Office in Washington, DC. Her areas of research includes US and India's agriculture and foreign policies, international security studies, sustainable development, climate change, gender justice, and urban environment. She is a good writer. She frequently writes in the print and electronic media and research journals and is the author of the book, Lessons on Sustainable Development from Bangladesh and India. Uh, it's published in 2019 by Palgrave, New York. She's a managing editor of Journal of Development Policy Review hosted by Indrastra, Indrastra uh, Global New York. So having said that, uh, Ambika ji and Simi, so uh, it's all yours. Thank you so much. Sure, thank you. Thank you, uh, Suman sir. And uh, Ambika sir, uh, with your permission, I would uh, begin the program. So uh, good evening everyone from New Delhi. On behalf of the Center for International Relations and Strategic Studies at Impact and Policy Research Institute, New Delhi, and International Development Institute, Washington DC, I extend my warm welcome to all the participants on Zoom as well as on Facebook Live. I thank the esteemed panelists for making time from your busy schedules and coming together to discuss India-Nepal relations. Um, founded on the age-old connections of history, culture, tradition, and religion, both countries have enjoyed the fruits of multifaceted engagements with each other. Uh, diplomatic ties between the two countries were cemented on 17th of June, 1947 with a commitment to the principles of peaceful coexistence, sovereign equality, and an understanding of each other's aspirations. High-level state visits from both sides have been an icing on the cake, and this has strengthened the vibrant bilateral relations. Amidst all this, there was a sudden jolt to the Bonhomi after India's defense minister virtually inaugurated a new 80 kilometer long road in the Himalayas at the Lipu Lake Pass with Dharchula in the state of Uttarakhand. This was protested by the government of Kharga Prasad Sharma Oli as it contended that the road crosses the Nepalese territory and accused India of changing the status quo without diplomatic consultations. Very soon, the Oli government responded by making a constitutional amendment to the administrative uh, and political map of the country showing that the Limpyadhura, Lipu Lake and Kalapani as part of its territory. This generated strong protests from the Indian state. In this situation, the strategic importance of the region cannot be underrated. This, uh, this new road is perhaps the quickest and the shortest route from New Delhi to the Tibetan Plateau. It is an important trade route and a passage for thousands of pilgrims to visit the holy Mount Kailash. 
Therefore, there is no doubt that it is in the best interests of both the countries to settle the border disputes and display pragmatism in their bilateral relations. To provide an in-depth perspective on the border dispute, we have with us an expert panel from India and Nepal. I'm delighted to introduce to you our guests from Nepal. We have with us Honorable Member of Parliament, Dr. Minendra Rizal from, uh, from Nepal, uh, who is a member of the Central Working Committee of the Nepal Congress Party. He has previously served as a Minister for Information and Communications and as a Minister for Constituent Assembly, Parliamentary Affairs and Culture. Dr. Rizal is also one of the architects of the mixed electoral system adopted by Nepal to ensure greater social and gender diversity in the Constituent Assembly. He is also currently a Shadow Finance Minister, Member of Parliament of Nepal since the year 2006. Honorable Dr. Rizal is also, uh, uh, is also a member of the Special Committee to oversee supervision, integration and rehabilitation from former Maoist combatants. Um, he is also a former member of the National Planning Commission of Nepal. Dr. Rizal earned his Bachelor of Science, Bachelor of Law and Masters in Management from Tripuan University in Nepal. He has also earned a Masters of Management degree from SUNY SUNY at Buffalo, New York, and an MPhil and PhD in Operations Research from the Stern School of Business at New York University. Dr. Rijal has also taught at New York University for three years, at Kathmandu University and Tribhuvan University, and also lectured at Lancaster University in UK. Dr. Rijal has 35 years of experience in research, teaching, and consulting in the fields of quantitative analysis, optimizations, operations, management, business management, transport economics, financial analysis, and planning, economic analysis, public policy formulation, and development economics. He has worked extensively with the government, universities, nonprofit organizations, private sector organizations, and international institutions. Thank you very much, sir, for being with us this evening. Our next guest from, for tonight is Mr. Ajay Pradhan, who is joining us from Vancouver, Canada. He is a senior policy advisor in the government of Canada on comprehensive uh, claims, comprehensive land claims uh, treaty negotiations. In this role, his responsibility includes policy analysis and advice in the area of nation to nation reconciliation on comprehensive land claims of asserted territories of indigenous people on a tripartite basis, Canada, British Columbia, and the First Nations Summit. He has managed the principles process in the British Columbia Treaty process and advised Canada's Ministry of Crown Indigenous Relations and Northern Affairs, one of the three principles uh, of the treaty process, and has managed the treaty-related measures to provide contribution funding to the First Nations in treaty process to advance reconciliation. He has studied the resource economics uh, and policy and at Duke University in Canada and uh, in uh, USA, excuse me, and he lives in Vancouver. Thank you very much, sir, for joining early in the morning from your place and a very good evening from India. Over to you, uh, Yeah, thank, thank you, Dr. Simi Mehta. Uh, let me introduce the two distinguished gentlemen uh, from India. They are so accomplished that I'm probably going to make it a little short bio because they're very well known in the community. First of all, Ambassador Su. He's a distinguished fellow at Observer Research Foundation, OARIA, in New Delhi. He joined the Indian Foreign Service in 1976, first serving in Brussels, Dhaka, Geneva, and Islamabad in many different capacities. As a deputy chief of mission in Washington, D.C., uh, <clears throat> at the ministry, he set up the disarmament International Security Affairs Division in the Foreign Ministry in India and led it for eight years. He had served as India's first ambassador and permanent representative to the Conference on Disarmament in Geneva and later as ambassador to Afghanistan, Nepal, and France. After retiring in 2013, Ambassador Sud was special envoy of the Prime Minister for Disarmament and Non-Proliferation a position he held until May 2014. Many other hats, but I think this should do for now. Major General P.K. Chakraborty is the winner of the silver gun in his young officer's course. He tenanted prestigious appointments in the Indian Army, serving also as a defense attaché 
to Vietnam, where he developed his interest in the Asia Pacific region. A prolific writer and strategic thinker on security issues, his erudition renders logic and substance to his writing and explores options, often new and substantive. Major General Chakraborty is a <clears throat> Uh, holds a PhD from Hindustan University in Chennai and MPhil from Madras University. He's written numerous periodicals, books, and articles, and his areas of interest are strategy, firepower, defense procurement, net assessment, South and Southeast Asia, Indo-Pacific, and left-wing extremism. The officer is also associated with the projects and articles on Indian Council of Historic Research in New Delhi. So very highly accomplished two individuals from India. So Simiji, you, do you want to start or you want to give me a little bit of a background and start the question? What is it? Yes, I can uh, just give a little bit of a background to the uh, distinguished panelists. Okay. Uh, uh, so uh, the way we'll uh, hold the session is that uh, I, we would request all of the panelists to uh, give their opening remarks for five minutes each. And um, after uh, your opening remarks, we'll have um, uh, two sets of questions um, by uh, Ambika sir and myself. And uh, after the questions have been answered, we'll be taking uh, some of the questions that have already been sent to us uh, on email. And uh, then we'll be taking questions from the chat box, uh, depending upon the time. So I request all the participants to write their questions and identify the panelist whom the question is to be uh, asked. So uh, this is the uh, format. So with this, I request Honorable um, uh, Member of Parliament, Dr. Minendra Rizal, to make his opening remarks. So could you please unmute your mic? Inviting me, uh, Sumanji, Ambikaji, uh, Parsuji, and others. Uh, certainly very good to see uh, Ambassador Sood after uh, such a long time. I mean, he's been a good friend. Uh, first of all, I mean, let me try to introduce this uh, uh, as something that is not very new. A lot of people, I believe, uh, I, I might be wrong here, but I mean, in, um, a lot of people in India do have a feeling that, that, that this is something Nepal has brought up uh, uh, very recently and at uh, the behest of uh, some political developments, which is not true. We've been saying this for the last 23 years. In 1997, when uh, then Prime Minister, Honorable, Right Honorable I.K. Guzral visited Nepal, we uh, brought up this issue and was recognized as a pending issue, uh, one of the pending issues between our two countries. In 2000, when Prime Minister G.P. Koirala visited India, uh, uh, this was recognized as one of the outstanding issues. Uh, since then, in all bilateral uh, meetings, this issue has been raised, and we've been consistently saying that this is something that both sides would have to sit down and uh, resolve it. From India also, we have always heard that uh, India is willing to sit down, and there was a joint uh, border management uh, committee uh, which worked for a long time, resolved uh, nine, almost 97% of the uh, border dispute between uh, our two countries, and, and that to the satisfa satisfaction of both the countries. And these are, there are certain places where we still have differences. And they, uh, since we are neighbors, I mean, we cannot, we cannot change neighbors. I mean, uh, no matter how prominent India will be in the international scenario, we, Nepal will still remain as a, as, as, a, uh, as a neighbor of India. And no matter how and where we are, uh, we as Nepalese, I mean, India is a very important friend, very important neighbor. And we have, uh, as, as was rightly uh, pointed out by the uh, host, uh, that our, our relationship has, has been as old and very friendly relationship. Actually, I mean, it predates uh, the, the uh, formation of our respective uh, political countries. I mean, we, uh, in past, uh, even before when Nepal was there and uh, India was there, uh, people from our, uh, both the countries, I mean, they did have a very close rapport with each other. Having said that, I guess I mean now we all have to recognize that uh, the situation today is not what one would like to see uh, continue for too long. Uh, provocations uh, that uh, were there on both sides, uh, I would say on the uh, on the Indian side, and certainly I'm an Indian uh, 
people or policymakers will uh, probably will be very uh, will certainly say that um, they were not very pleased to what they heard uh, from Nepal also. That that's okay. But on both sides, you have to sit down and resolve this. One of the things we have heard, even despite all the difficulties we have faced in the recent past, is uh, no matter how strongly worded statement has come out from India, uh, one of one of the things that has been consistently been, uh, uh, mentioned in. Uh, in, in the communique has been that both sides will have, will have to sit down and uh, find a solution uh, peacefully and uh, through diplomatic means. We are ready for that. And one of the things we're waiting for, uh, was once the COVID uh, crisis is over, both sides can sit down, present their evidences and look at the evidences and decide on uh, the, the status of uh, the outstanding uh, uh, issue. I, I, I guess it will be uh, people on both sides, policymakers on both sides will be well, well advised to, to, to uh, be very patient, to be respecting of each other. Uh, and also, I guess, uh, people from both sides and policymakers from both sides should uh, 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 talk to their respective people and uh, tell people or ed educate people that uh, import, the importance of ties between our two countries are of paramount significance uh, to both countries. Our relationship uh, certainly was, has been, and will be on sovereign equality basis. And this is one of the uh, one of the difficulties we have. But there are many other things that keeps uh, our ties uh, as close as, as they have ever been. But this is something that has to be resolved uh, by both the sides. Uh, I would not uh, dwell into the details of the evidences. How, what is written in the Sugoli Sunday, uh, Sugoli Treaty, uh, what, uh, how, what, what, how was the map that was drawn in 1827, 1846, 1856, uh, or many other facts. And these, I will leave it up to um, Azhar Pradhan, who I'm sure is more competent than me on, uh, on these uh, issues. That's his expertise also uh, to bring those out. And, but again, I mean, having said that, uh, these are the issues that both sides, when they sit down on the table, uh, they will have to attend to. Uh, so for that, uh, with that, I guess uh, if I have finished my uh, five minutes already, I'll just stop there. Sure. sure. Thank you so much, sir, for providing your initial remarks. And uh, certainly we'll get back to you uh, with uh, a number of questions that are being raised. Thank you very much, sir, for making your opening comments. Um, I would now request uh, Mr. Ajay Pradhan to provide his initial thoughts on the status of the border disputes related to the Olympia Dhura, Lipu Lake, and the Kalapani area. And if, you, if you could provide a little bit of history, data, and your own personal experience and your observation and analysis to the dispute, sir. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Mehta. Um, First of all, just a disclaimer, um, I am present uh, in this uh, event uh, as a member of the Nepali diaspora, uh, and I'm not representing my employer, the government of Canada. Um, so with that, um, you know, I just want to delve into the nature of the issue here. Uh, first, um, I think Dr. Mehta a, a moment ago alluded to the age old ties between the two countries. and. There is uh, no doubt about that. The, we have very strong uh, cultural, linguistic, um, you know, religious uh, and socioeconomic ties between the two countries, uh, kinship and family ties across the border, common culture and religion and shared traditions through linguistic commonality rooted in Sanskrit language, economy and trade and open border. And in addition to that, many of Nepal's um, political leaders in the past um, contributed to the independence movement of India. Um, and likewise, many Indian leaders, political leaders have uh, extended their moral support to a um, number of uh, political movements in Nepal. So, um, you know, um, th these are the uh, hallmarks of the relationship between the two countries uh, that have coexisted for millennia, even well before the independence of India. Um, as a uh, very uh, productive and um, in a very productive and friendly relationship. Um, so um, this uh, border issue has arisen as a bit of a um, you know, pause in that um, relationship. Um, but I, I am very positive, um, very hopeful, and very, um, you know, um, much certain that this will 
be resolved, uh, you know, over time. Um, I'm not sure how soon that will happen, but uh, this is, um, even though this is an irritant, this also offers both countries an opportunity to not only sustain the age-old ties, but also to strengthen the relationship between the two countries. So um, the, I think if we look at this um, irritation or irritant as an opportunity rather than an obstacle to our relationship, I think we can begin an honest and uh, open discussion across a uh, negotiating table. So how do we start about um, you know, uh, how to go forward? I think the first um, step for both sides would be to honestly acknowledge um, and accept that there is a dispute. Uh, just ignoring the dispute is not gonna get us anywhere. Uh, so uh, that is the first step. And, and then comes the, the issue about the evidence sharing by both countries with each other and each uh, country will be doing their own strength of claim analysis um, you know, on the um, evidences and records submitted and shared by the um, counterpart. Um, that's how I think the, um, the negotiation process will begin. And um, you know, this is the, um, just the process to maintain a, um, you know, the relationship that the two countries have. And in doing that, I think uh, it is incumbent upon both sides to the dispute to acknowledge, uh, not only acknowledge the dispute, but also to understand the concerns of each other. So I think, um, you know, I'm not sure um, what the motivations are about the, um, uh, you know, with India about uh, the construction of the road and that sort of thing. But I suspect that Nepal uh, government has to be receptive to the concerns of India. And in my own judgment, I see three uh, key uh, motivations or three key concerns that India has. One is the strategic security. The second is the cultural and religious pilgrimage to Kailash Mansarovar. And third, um, not the last one, but the trade and um, you know, um, transit as to um, broader China and Tibet through Lipulek Pass. Um, so um, the, um, with the uh, negotiated, um, you know, uh, negotiation process, I think the two parties can come to a negotiated resolution and settlement, which is much more preferable to a court settlement. Um, I don't think court settlement is the way to go. Um, negotiated uh, settlement across the table and through diplomatic channels, not through public media and Twitter, but through diplomatic channels and face-to-face um, -face across the table, negotiation table should be the way to go. I'll stop there. Great, thank you. Uh, Ambika sir, over to you. Could, could you unmute, unmute your mic? Yes. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Simi Mehta. That was wonderful. Uh, before I go to Ambassador Sood and uh, uh, General Chakraborty. Dr. Mehta laid out a really good background, which was uh, also added upon by Mr. Pradhan and Dr. Rizal. Just a couple of sentences I would like to add to frame the whole thing and then I'll come to uh, Ambassador Sood. The relationship between Nepal and India is also very symmetrical. These are neighbors, but in terms of population, India is 47 and a half times bigger than Nepal. In terms of the geographical area, India is 22 and a half times. Economy of India is 100 times that of Nepal. And uh, the Indian exports to Nepal just amount to about 2%. So there's uh, uh, some level of asymmetry, but uh, things were spoken before. We have a shared heritage, most importantly, open border. And majority of the disputes do happen among the enemies or people who are not very friendly. We happen to be very, very friendly for a long period of time. And more importantly, we have very similar values that we share, we share. That is democracy, diversity, culture, language, peace, and uh, the belief in Panchasit. The nation state of Nepal is also now has a lot of aspiration as a modern nation state. It wants to be treated with respect, dignity, and equality uh, while understanding the reality. With all of that being given, uh, Ambassador Sood 
just the way that uh, Dr. Rijal and Mr. Pradhan gave a little bit at the beginning outlook, if you can provide us a brief analysis from your perspective. And let me also mention that because of the short period of time, we're not going back a lot to the data and the history, but more on how to move forward is our emphasis. But uh, Bill, please do feel free to bring any data and analysis that you wish, Ambassador Sue. Thank you. I think uh, it is important uh, to go back a little bit into the history for the simple reason that unfortunately a lot of myths get created and uh, sometimes it is important to dispel these myths. As, as everybody knows, India became independent in 1947 and we inherited the boundary that had been drawn up between the East India Company and Nepal. So, and that boundary was essentially drawn up by the Treaty of Siboli. Uh, before India became independent, there were already maps of uh, British India and there were maps of Nepal. And uh, none of these maps uh, include uh, the territory that has been questioned. After 1947, as uh, Dr. Rizal also told us, it was in 1996, 97, that the matter was raised for the first time. And obviously India said, yeah, sure, let's sit down and talk about it. Um, I, when I was ambassador in Nepal, and I remember my time there with great affection, I have had occasion to talk about this. And uh, the subject that was often talked about was the issue of Kalapani. Now, Kalapani, as you know, is a very small piece of territory. And uh, the issue was that India had a, a military and sometimes the ITBP paramilitary force camp there. And uh, at no point in time, was the issue of Lipu Lake or Limpia Dura brought up at all during these talks. So be that as it may, I mean, uh, I, have, I have maintained and I have stated this publicly on more than one forum, including in an interview with the uh, well-known Nepali journalist Kanak Dikshit that I do think that uh, India should have engaged in a dialogue with Nepal when Nepal was officially asking us to discuss this matter. And I think that uh, because we were uh, somewhat tardy in doing so, I guess uh, Nepal was uh, a little upset. But having been a diplomat and having seen how governments work, we also know that uh, we had certain changes um, in our ambassador. We had the change of foreign secretary. And uh, these things also tend to then, what happens is that you end up looking at the urgent and not the important. However, I do think that neighbors should be looked at as both urgent and important. And that is something that I do maintain. So we should have taken it up. Now, having said that, I still don't see why um, the inauguration became such a major issue for the simple reason that the road had been under construction for more than 10 years. At no point in time during these 10 years had Nepal protested about the alignment of the road. Um, Dr. Rizal is a politician. And I'm sure he will agree with me that politicians love to inaugurate projects. And so it is quite natural on the part of the defense minister to have wanted to inaugurate this road, particularly as uh, this was a road that is used by pilgrims uh, going to Kailash Mansarovar. And the pilgrimage season normally begins around this time. So I guess uh, he wanted to... Um, sort of appeal to a certain popular base, and that was understandable. Why that should have suddenly triggered a desire to uh, not just to amend the map, but then to further solidify it in terms of uh, through a constitutional amendment, I uh, fail to understand the motivation of that. Um, 
I mean, I do not want to uh, get into the issue of Nepal's domestic politics here, but uh, we do know that uh, uh, Prime Minister Oli has been having a certain amount of problems. And in fact, uh, he took this as a political lifeline. Uh, so, but now um, the way I look at it is that uh, official level talks are pointless. Because no official, no foreign secretary, whether the foreign secretary of Nepal or the foreign secretary of India, can actually sit down and have the mandate to change the maps. So I think we will have to wait and see uh, for some political guidance because now parliaments have passed, parliaments have adopted constitutional amendments and uh, yeah. ma maps have been changed. So I guess we have now created a territorial dispute between India and Nepal. And it is not going to be easy. I don't think there will be, it will be very difficult for uh, uh, people to have, uh, to get around this. And uh, I think this will certainly be remembered as Prime Minister Oli's lasting legacy to have created an insurmountable problem in India and Nepal relations. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador Sud. I'm gonna ask the same question to Major General Chakraborty. And if you could be brief, maybe within three to five minutes, because we'll come back to some of those issues later on. Just give you a brief point as a background, uh, Major General Chakraborty. Oh, thank you, Dr. Adhikari and Dr. Simi. And I'm grateful to all the panelists because they I have had a good chance of hearing to everybody's views and I can therefore give my views. A little bit about myself, being from the Indian Army, the first unit I landed had people from Nepal. So my relationship with Nepal is beyond borders and beyond all these issues. And when I visit Nepal, and when I go to Pokhara, I feel I'm back into my own unit. People are receiving pensions and I, the relationship within me for the Nepalese to me meant giving life and death. So all these issues which you are bringing out, well, I'll put them into correct perspective. Firstly, dealing with borders is nothing new for India. Firstly, I must say we are settled with Bangladesh. Such a major issue without making any things. You have brought up a problem, which as Ambassador Sood correctly said, none of us knew. We knew of Kalapani. The road was being made by the border roads and it's 80 kilometers road. And all of a sudden the defense minister goes and inaugurates and a big issue is made the issues and at the same time please understand what is the overall issue in the world we have got covid going on we have got a serious issue with china going on and when, definitely you will say well it's a, it's something which the president has signed the constitution amendment but as a military man i also understand nepal a bit too well after all we are paying almost more than a billion dollars of pension every year and as you brought out all the statistics, one statistics uh, which I want to bring out, Nepal is about 2.81 crores or so. That is the exact location I received right now. And we have got 130 crores. So we are 65 times your population. And we have a heart which is very big. There are 7 million Nepalese. And, and the best part I want to share with you, I must say this, while you can come and build a house here, you can have a marriage, I can't do that in Nepal. And let me tell you the state in which these three regions are, as since uh, Dr. Ajay Pradhan is sitting over there, is the state of Uttarakhand. And in Dehradun, we have got a sizable people from Nepal who are settled down, who are doing beautifully. I just go and meet them every year. So therefore, these three, two areas have definitely come like a bolt from the blue, as Ambassador Sud. I mean, I won't even report Lipuli and Lipumetra. Definitely, I one night know Kalapani certainly was an issue which was raised and definitely but the point is now you have taken it to such a level well as an army man nothing surprises me because we deal with pakistan we deal with china i've written about the entire china border and how exactly two prime ministers jawala nehru and soyan lai and our diplomats struggled for so many years and we are still struggling so don't worry as as far as we are concerned Nepal is not certainly China. Nepal is not Pakistan. Nepal is too close to us. 
It's a relation of blood. Your people lay down their lives for me. So it's more than what you're talking of a map. Maps are something an uh, army man deals every day. They will get resolved. Yes, now how you resolve it? As a, would you like to go to the courts? Would you like, we require definitely political guidance and the political guidance as we are looking at it. Ambassador, uh, Prime Minister only definitely did the issue in a very quick things. There are so many things being raised which I don't want to bring up for obvious reasons. I would like to put at the military level, please understand that the chief of army staff of Nepal is also a general of the Indian army. Probably this may be known to you and our chief of army staff is also your general. So with these close relations, I see nothing that is impossible. There's nothing to worry. The border, you can still cross it. Please, people from that side are coming this side. From our side, they're going that side. 1,751 kilometers is an open border. And we certainly have full respect for your people. Please come, settle down, build the house, marry over here, do whatever you want. Why are you so worried that in such a short time, your president signs an amendment? At least speak to them. As I said, there are diplomats like Ambassador Suta, Ambassador there. Speak to them. We have a defense at Tashi. Probably the biggest defense mission is in Kathmandu. So I would like that the whole issue be seen in correct perspective and see the closeness that we have and then look at it not as something which is insurmountable, but definitely look at it as something now, how do we find a solution? And I think the stakes are in Nepal. India can do very little unless you think about it in a different way. If you now include four more places, all that we have to say is, okay, please add this to the dispute. Thank you so much, Major General <clears throat> Sakrabarti, for your very passionate remark. Now, Dr. Simi and myself will alternate and ask some questions on how to go forward. I yield to Dr. Simi Mehta for now. Thank you, thank you uh, sir. And thank you all the esteemed panelists. Uh, so uh, my uh, set of questions is uh, directed to Dr. Rijal and Mr. Pradhan. Um, uh, and, uh, it's perhaps uh, you could uh, uh, you could uh, combine these set of questions with uh, with responses uh, that you would like to make to your uh, to the Indian panelists. Uh, and so uh, this is the, the question is uh, the fact that India's relationship with Nepal goes beyond the current current uh, map dispute to a much larger set of ties. What do you think are the ways towards potential resolution of the issues? And how do the how should the government of India and Nepal approach this topic, given the importance of the long history of friendly relations, especially the people to people ties? What are some of the emotional and strategic issues that are related to the area subject to the border dispute? And it also appears uh, very clearly that both sides uh, in the dispute feel that uh, the other side has acted to trigger the escalation of the dispute. What are your thoughts on that? And uh, what kind of initiatives both the countries should take to improve the current environment for fruitful negotiations? Um, I would request Dr. Rijal to go first. Yes. Let, let me just try to clarify a few things first. Uh, yes. Yes. Nepal, back in 1961, 1961 Nepal census included people living in that area. Uh, 1959, during 1959 election to the general election to the parliament, people from this area uh, did participate in the election, voted. Uh, and until 1961, people in this area were paying regular land, land tax. Uh, and we have evidences of that. And we have maps uh, which were published in 19, 1827, 1846, 1856. But, but the thing is, I'm not going to go into details of that. What I'm saying is we're ready to sit down and talk about it, present our evidence, we'll be willing to uh, sit down and look at the evidence, uh, evidence as India has to present. We are not asking for an inch of land that belongs to India. Yeah? We very strongly feel, uh, and our, we feel that our evidence is pretty strong, and then we, 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 what we're saying is we'll present our evidence, we'll sit down and, and talk, and then uh, uh, resolve this. Uh, uh, I guess on that could that could be done when we both sides will agree to sit down. That has not happened. 
Uh, during the initial phase of uh, COVID crisis, uh, the letter we received from uh, India was, once both countries and societies are uh, done dealing with the COVID crisis, we can sit down and resolve it uh, through diplomatic means. We're waiting for that, as was rightly pointed out, uh, uh, inauguration, virtual inauguration was done. Uh, and after the virtual inauguration was done, uh, the remarks from the uh, chief of Indian Army came, which uh, suggested that Nepal is doing uh, this at the prompting of uh, another neighbor, which, which, is, which is very unfortunate. Some of, some of the comments I'm seeing uh, um, online also, a lot of people are thinking, why, why has uh, China been brought into it? Why has Pakistan been uh, brought into it? We have not brought it. I guess I mean, Indian media is fond of talking about China. Indian media is, uh, Indian uh, so, uh, social network is fond of talking about um, uh, China and uh, Pakistan inducing Nepal to do it. No. And this is not something recent that has come up. As I pointed out earlier also, uh, this has been there for 27 years. And then this, uh, Ambassador Sud was right uh, when he pointed out that we should have long uh, before sat down and uh, looked at the evidences and tried to resolve it. And then again, and this is not something that uh, does not happen between ten, two neighbors. I mean, this is not something that has not happened uh, uh, to, a, to a, either of our countries. I mean, we've resolved border issues with China back in 1960. 97% uh, of the border uh, uh, is pretty clear uh, between our two countries. Every time when uh, the Joint Commission has sat down, we have always said, our Nepali side has said that, said that once, the entire border uh, issue is resolved and we'll sign the papers. Uh, at times we have heard from the Indian side that I mean, whatever has been resolved, let's sign it and then work on the rest uh, and resolve it. Uh, that's that's Indian uh, position. So I guess certainly it's very important that uh, both countries would have senses, a sense to sit down, uh, resolve it. Uh, if it belongs to India, India keeps it. If it belongs to us, we keep it. Uh, but as far as constitutional amendment and all these issues are concerned, uh, why should this be seen as something that uh, uh, has created uh, uh, the more tension than it should have been? I mean, this is uh, our position and our evidence suggests that we strongly believe that this is our land. And uh, we feel very rightful to uh, 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 put that in the emblem. We feel very rightful to uh, put that in, in our uh, map. Uh, this probably would not have been such had India not published a map which includes this uh, uh, part as an as integral part of India. And that certainly uh, prompt, prompted us and we, I think was rightful for us to do uh, what we did uh, to present uh, Nepal as we see Nepal is geographically. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, providing your uh, answers. Uh, I would request Mr. Ajay Pradhan to respond. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> let me just, um, you know, speak to uh, something Ambassador Sood um, mentioned about the inheritance of the maps uh, by independent India after 1947. Um, if I could just be impertinent to uh, mention that, um, you know, uh, starting from 1816, when the Treaty of Sioli was ratified, um, East India Company had uh, prepared a series of maps starting from uh, well before actually 1816 Sioli Treaty, but uh, I will just start from 1816. So there was on January 2nd, 1816, East India Company uh, brought out a map that showed uh, the uh, Kali River um, starting from the headwaters in Limpiadhura, not in Lipu Lake and Kalapani area. Um, again, 1819, um, a map was prepared by Captain Webbs of uh, East India Company, uh, showing the same thing as before. 1827, uh, prepared by um, uh, James Harbour, uh, a hydrogeographer of East India Company, showing the same thing. 1835, map published by East India Company in London, 1837 by J.B. Tassin of East India Company, uh, published in Persian actually. Um, and then 1846, uh, a map showing the headwaters in Kali, of Kali River in Limpiadura. Uh, 1846 map by William Allen, 
1850 map, deputy survey, map by Deputy Surveyor General of India, and 1856 map, the last one that showed um, the Kali River starting from Limpiadura was published in 1856 uh, by the Surveyor, Surveyor General of uh, India. Now, after that, I recognized that the map was altered by India, but we have to recognize that alteration was not on a bilateral basis, it was unilateral, and it was never consulted. Uh, Nepal was never consulted, as far as I know, uh, about the um, you know alteration of those um, the uh, the leveling of the rivers from um, Limpiadura to uh, Lipu Lake. Um, so that is one thing I think. Um, yeah, India did uh, inherit and inherited the um, uh, the uh, maps, you know uh, that you know, uh, were, that were prepared after 19, 1856. But uh, both countries, um, India as well as Nepal, still have Treaty of Stigolia as the basis um, of the, um, you know, uh, border issue on the west side of Nepal. And that treaty is, is not dead. And the section uh, Article 5 of the treaty, is still alive, clearly says that the Kali River is the boundary of Nepal. The dispute is mainly, dispute is not about whether or not Kali is the boundary. The dispute is which river in that area is the Kali River. Um, if you look at the, all the series of maps that I mentioned just now listed up until 19, 1856, every single map showed the uh, the stem, main stem upstream of Gunji, the village of Gunji, starting in the headwaters of Olympia Azura, is the Kali River. So based on that, um, Nepal does have a point, I believe. Now, um, I understand that India's position is different. And um, I'm not saying that India is wrong, but I believe it is wrong because uh, it is a matter of it is not a political matter. It's uh, you know how rivers are uh, determined as to uh, whether or not they are the main rivers and tributaries. They are determined technically um, by hydrograph hydrogeographers, um, you know, uh, watershed hydrologists, uh, river morphologists, and that sort of thing. And I think the negotiation uh, will have to create some room for that technical, you know, study in the area that you know both sides. Uh, you know, experts from both sides, or maybe independent experts, should be given an opportunity to, you know, speak to that issue. Um, the other thing about the, um, you know, the uh, amendment to Nepal's constitution incorporating the new map, I uh, do not think I necessarily agree with, um, you know, what has been said before. The the alteration to the map um, is a course correction. Uh, if anything, it is a course correction by Nepal because up until now, the historical maps didn't show the um, area that is uh, under dispute as part of, um, you know, uh, the maps that were that I remember, you know, read, uh, reading in school curriculums and and things like that. But it is um, a step taken by the parliament of Nepal um, and the government of Nepal as a, an act of assertion of its sovereign rights that was, uh, that was derived from the Treaty of Sugoli. Um, Treaty of Sugoli gave each country, both countries, uh, India and Nepal, a um, clear um, you know, idea about what is the, um, the uh, Western boundary of Nepal and the eastern boundary of Uttarakhand, or at that time it was Uttar Pradesh, I guess. Um, um, so uh, the uh, there is, uh, but uh, the uh, the you know the uh, incorporation of the new map in part in the uh, Constitution of Nepal, the amended Constitution of Nepal. I do not think it is such a bad uh, thing, and I don't think it is a hurdle. If anything, it is a assertion of the uh, you know sovereign territorial uh, rights, uh, and then um, that is also um, something that you know can be a starting point, at least from the perspective of Nepal, to begin a negotiation. Nepal has to say to India, okay, what we believe is ours should be clearly communicated, and I think that act is a um, a reflection of that. Thank you. 
thank you very much uh, mr pradhan dr ambika over to you thank you so much uh, dr mehta um i just got a note from the organizer that we've been given a 15 minutes grace so in terms of time management we have another 20 or 22 minutes remaining we started just a couple of minutes late so please do be do uh, uh, consider time i hope you are available i'm going back to ambassador sud with the same framing question that uh, simi mehta asked which is basically the gamut of relationship between the two countries is very extensive and there are also emotional issues Uh, like i mentioned before nepal also had an aspiration to be a more nascent state uh, 30 million people it looks very small just because it's between the two zones otherwise it's a reasonable size country and given all of that strategic feeling and some sort of uh, the feeling that the other side triggered even um, uh, ambassador sud you've been ambassador to nepal you're a very keen observer of all of these things Uh, what would be your opinion going forward how these issues could be resolved and how would you react thank you uh, well i think uh, i'm very glad that uh, dr pradhan has said that after 1856 the maps showed a different uh, alignment india was not an independent country till 1947 and uh, so i would have thought that perhaps the british had had a political agent the office of the political agent existed in kathmandu um, after the treaty of sugoli so perhaps if this was taken up because i have seen every single nepali map actually aligned the way it is secondly even if the alignment of the map and these are survey maps mind you i have here a letter which is dated 5th of september 1817 by the then secretary to the governor general of india and he is writing on mind you this is 5th of september 1817 and this is a letter addressed to the commissioner of kumaon and he says the governor general approves your having declined to transfer to chautra bumsa the two villages of kunti and nabi in pargana byanse without the specific orders of the government on the grounds of their being situated to the west of the stream ordinarily recognized as the principal branch in that quarter on examination of the maps transmitted by you and of the facts and circumstances detailed by you and lieutenant webb the same person who dr pradhan referred to it has left no doubt on the mind of the governor general that the stream denominated kalapani is that which is to be considered as the principal branch of the kali and as such it is to be held the boundary between the possession of the two states as a question of equity and just construction of the treaty he goes on to further say you are authorized to pay bumsa sona rupees 140.13 on account of the revenues of the villages of tinkar and chonguru i mean this is 1817 so i mean i would say that the british very clearly even in 1817 uh, the local uh, raja or the local choudhury would have raised this and it was dismissed by in 1817 itself and the revenues of those two villages and so that is how uh, so i frankly think that um it is a little bit difficult i mean uh, nepal as a sovereign state should have taken it up with the office with the political agent of britain who was posted in kathmandu from time to time and uh, so therefore it's a little bit difficult now to uh, take this up at this stage yes we agreed to talk about it and i and as i said right at the outset i think we should have dealt with it more seriously but then you know i can tell you about a number of issues from the 1990s we've had the uh, successive prime ministers of nepal have raised the issue of the 1950 treaty we have always agreed to talk about it and i can tell you that when i was there and every time there would be the foreign secretary level talk so the foreign minister was coming and i would go 
to the foreign ministry to discuss the agenda for the talks. And I would say, well, should we take this up? And I would invariably be told, no, 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 we don't want to take it up. It's, we'll wait. We haven't done our, we, we haven't, we need to do some more preparatory work for us. And it had never been taken up. But uh, what this example shows is that uh, you can't let differences spend indefinitely because then differences become um, disputes. That is one. Secondly, I would like to submit that uh, civil servants do not have the mandate. I mean, I heard what Dr. Pradhan said about, and Dr. Rizal also said that why should the, the fact that there is a constitutional amendment, why should that make a difference? I'm afraid it makes a hell of a lot of difference because I do not think that even forget a Nepali foreign secretary, even the Nepali prime minister will have to get a mandate from the parliament to be able to discuss something. Unless, of course, the purpose is only to say that, okay, this is it, take it or leave it. If that is the case, then obviously, then there is no room for talks. And so that is why I think that the amendment passing of a constitutional amendment is something which, as I said at the outset, it will be remembered as Prime Minister Oli's lasting legacy for having created an insurmountable obstacle in the bilateral relationship. It will take a very, very brave Prime Minister to be able to discuss somebody who knows that because whatever be the outcome of the discussions, it will require another constitutional amendment in Nepal. Isn't it? That would be, I mean, I would think that that is absolutely essential then. Uh, finally, I mean, I think that, uh, again, it is, uh, therefore, I, I frankly, I, I don't see how we can get around it in the near term and through talks. I mean, at most, what we can try and do is perhaps when the prime ministers meet at some political level, they will have to find a way out to see as to what is going to be the way to resolve it. But it certainly cannot be foreign secretary level talks because they, I don't think civil servants have the mandate to overturn or even to discuss or even to negotiate on a constitutional, on a constitutional amendment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador Sood. So given the limited time, we've also been getting a lot of questions from the chat box. I'm going to ask the similar question to Major General Chakraborty, who spoke about his excellent relationship and his feeling with the overall relationship with uh, uh, Nepal and India. So I'm going to give him the opportunity to think of that whole gamut, very wide relationship. This is only one of the irritants, just one item which probably can be resolved. But I'm also going to uh, build in just a couple of the chat box question to him. Uh, one of them is why does, uh, there's a question, why does India like to pay big brother? I listened to uh, Ambassador Suits and Mr. Dixit's uh, interview and Mr. Dixit says, well, India is big and India is your brother, but it's not a big brother, but you know, that was his point of view. So uh, <clears throat> Major General Chakraborty, if you could dwell on some of these emotional aspects and the wider relations that, that we have in terms of dealing and analyzing this issue, that will be greatly appreciated. Oh, thank you. I just start firstly with the border itself. Now, very clearly, Nepal has been an independent country. You fought a war with the East India Company, not with the British. Uh, Dr. Pradhan brought out so many things and you had your, uh, I'll say, full sovereign rights to discuss. And uh, East India Company, as you know, went off of post-1857. Even after that, all the dates that you are given, you had all the time, all the energy to discuss. You should have sorted out these issues. You have taken the maps. You had excellent relations with the British. As a matter of fact, the British Gurkhas went all the way and they remained a part of the Queen's zone. I mean, so till the British couldn't afford to give you pensions. Well, India still affords to employ your people and give you, so you had the best of time and best of relations. We didn't form these borders. It was formed by you. What I think uh, Dr. Pradhan brought out is really, which is the river. 
this has been discussed. I've gone through all the documents like Ambassador Rakesh, right from 1816. And they were all army officers, lieutenants and captains, you know, of the British who are going. Some of them landed up with malaria. Some of them landed. And by the way, you must understand that you had the British agent sitting in Kathmandu. So, and he was really, he could be influenced. Why did Nepal do it? Well, these are issues purely as reply to Dr. Pradhan. Now come on to what do we do now? Well, it's a very, very, it's a like, uh, there's no silver bullet to what you have done. I'll put it very plainly. You have, you have undertaken a constitutional amendment. That means all issues have now got to be discussed at only one level, which is the political level. It has crossed diplomatic level. It has crossed the, what should we say? Even today with China, we, we have at least some understanding where at the military level we go and talk. You are here, you are there. And there's some way. So, well, in this case, it has to be a political level talk. And I'm sure that we, we are not so distant. Uh, uh, both the prime ministers know each other and they talk to each other. There's so many, as you said, Nepalese leaders have fought for our independence. You are a sovereign country, but you're fighting for India's independence. So the issue definitely, like all issues, would be resolved. But by making a constitutional amendment, you have created a problem in the resolution. Well, it's a sovereign right. As I said, sovereign right, please include five more places. Your country. We cannot come in. There. And there's nothing in countries as big and small. I was a defense attache in Vietnam. And Vietnam has defeated all the four countries. So it's not... It's all the four big powers who are sitting today there, including China. So there's nothing as big and small. You are a country, we respect you. So this question like India being a big brother, there's no question of a big or small. Well, uh, you know, see, the Nepalese boys, we used to call them Daju and we used to call them Guruji. You know, these are words which are commonly used in Nepal. All right. But there's no question of India being any big brother, any small brother or something. We are very closely related. We love you. We accept you. I can tell you that no country, if you can give me one example, the Canada Canadian citizen joined the United States Army or a Mexican citizen. Today, the Indian Army has 32,000 Nepalese boys. And you've got officers, you've got generals, you've got brigadiers. We have accepted them. So what is the elder brother and big brother? Today, a Nepalese a colonel who may be my CEO, he may be my brigade commander, and I may be posted in Kashmir under him. But who's the big brother then? I would be getting my one day's casual leave, and you know, those of you who know how difficult in the army it is to get a day's casual leave, I'll be getting it from a Nepalese citizen. So where is the elder brother and big brother? We are equals, we believe in each other, we respect you, we respect your parliament, we respect your constitution, we respect all of you. And all issues have to be resolved by certain norms. And those norms have to be international norms. They cannot be something that as Ambassador Sud correctly pointed out, which a diplomat can take on. See, once you reach a particular level, we cannot. And India definitely, I don't think, has any wrong notions. As a matter of fact, you should read Ambassador Sham Sharan's book where I think is brought out very clearly. We would like to give Nepal all rights which we give to Indian citizens. So that's all we would like to see. And we are not, as I think, very rightly, I remember reading Ambassador Sood's one article. India never asked for a reciprocal issue that we want property in Kathmandu for an Indian citizen. We have never asked you for these things. But we say, please come, settle down. My neighbor is a brigadier. Brigadier who belongs to Nepal. He stays just exactly four rooms away from me. He's staying here and six months he spends in Kathmandu, six months he spends in Delhi. Now that is the relationship today. So it's nothing very great, which you, or both of you have pointed out. I leave it to you and I, it will be resolved. If we can, if people, if people of your country can live with us, we can definitely resolve all these maps. I've been dealing with maps since I, I joined the um, NDA which is now, I must say, 1952 years, I'm only seeing maps and maps and maps. And what did China do? What did Pakistan do? What did Bangladesh do? What did Myanmar do? We have problems with everybody. 
don't think you are the only country. Whoever is there, there's problems even between houses in Kathmandu. People are fighting whether the gate should be here or not there. So these are issues. Please give us time, and only time will help us to resolve. Thank, thank you so much, Major General Chakraborty. Very passionate. Lots of really good message and love and friendship. That's greatly appreciated. Now, in terms of the time, I think we've got another 10 or 12 minutes remaining. And we will basically be uh, asking some of the questions from the chat box. Why didn't I ask Dr. Simi Mehta to uh, pick up one or two, and then I'll pick up one or two. But these now have to be very briefly responded to. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Um, so. Uh, this set of questions uh, is directed to Dr. Rajal and Mr. Uh, Ajay Pradhan, and uh, you could uh, take turns to answer this. So the question is uh, from uh, uh, the, uh, the fact that Nepal is a landlocked country, and uh, how would import new bulk commodities without using the Indian territory in the event of a further deepening of the border? Um, how can the inflammatory and aggressive coverage by some media outlets on both sides be discouraged? And uh, what kind of a time frame do you think would be necessary for a cooling down of the protests and misgivings uh, so that a reasonable and friendly environment for a dignified uh, discussion framework emerges? And uh, also, there is uh, a lot of um, uh, curiosity as to uh, how has... Uh, what do you have to say about the move as being a sudden awakening on the map adjustment process? Uh, so over to you, uh, Dr. Rajal. Dr. Rajal, are you there with us? I think uh, he's having some. We can start with Mr. Pradhan and then come back to Dr. Rizal. Mr. Pradhan, please uh, respond. Thank you, Dr. Mehta. Um, uh, I will just uh, mention what uh, General Chakrabarti said, which really touched my heart. I actually was born in India, and I have great love uh, for India and Indian people. Although I never became an Indian citizen, but I feel very close to India in every respect. I have traveled all across India, met uh, many Indian people in my life, and uh, have formed a really uh, long-lasting friendship with a lot of Indian friends um, in Nepal and here in Canada as well. And uh, when I was in the U.S., many, many friends there as well. So wherever I go, I mean, India is never too far from my heart. So, um, you know, um, what uh, General Chakrabarti said, uh, there is no uh, big brother, small brother relationship. And I really uh, thank him for that statement uh, because uh, even though there is asymmetrical uh, power relationship between the two countries, um, the two countries are equal in terms of sovereignty. And this is something that I, in my own day job here in Canada, uh, you know, always fall back on. Um, I work um, as a um, as a as an advisor in the area of treaty negotiations with uh, uh, First Nations in Canada, and um, you know First Nations are small communities, uh, and there is a great asymmetrical relationship between the uh, the country of Canada and the First Nations. Uh, but the um, negotiations um, when uh, begin. Uh, Canada never considers uh, the, the negotiating parties as small or, you know, small brother or something like this. So thank you, uh, General Chakrabarti, about that statement. I really appreciate that. Now, in terms of the, um, the, uh, the, the map issue, again, coming back to the, um, to the amendment of the Constitution, the, the reason I said that I do not think it is, it is such a big uh, thing is that um, it, 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 you have to, um, I think uh, we have to go back to the Treaty of Seville. The Treaty of Seville is the only bilateral, um, you know, um, agreement that touches upon the border on the western uh, side of Nepal. Um, and that really leaves us no, I mean, uh, based on what has been um, agreed upon in uh, the Treaty of Seville, Nepal's hands are tied. Either it it has to accept India's position that the 
river originating from Limpia, sorry, Lipu Lake, is the actual Kali River. And if that is the case, then India, there is no uh, claim for Nepal. But if uh, India agrees that, you know, uh, there are some evidences in the, um, uh, in terms of the historical uh, records, um, you know, maps uh, starting from, um, you know, 1816, right up to 1869, and I acknowledge Ambassador Suits reference to the um, 1817 map, um, then I, I will speak to that in just a, mo in just a moment. Um, but, you know, um, so either- Mr. Pradhan, Mr. Pradhan could, could we be in the interest of time a little brief, please? That would be appreciated by every, from everyone. Okay, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, the issue is, um, uh, you know, for Nepal, it is either, you know, agree with one, uh, you know, river or the other river as being Kali. And so uh, the amendment to the constitution is basically a reflection of that um, India and Nepal's position that, you know, the uh, the Kali River starting from Limpia Dura is the, is the uh, you know, the actual Kali River, then the other one is just a tributary based on all the scientific and, uh, you know, physical parameters. Um, and we don't, we're not getting into all the scientific, you know, uh, analysis of that thing. But, and this is the kind of things that I think will be discussed across the table um, uh, when the negotiations start. So I'll leave it at that for now. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Yes. I'm, uh, I do not think I will have a lot of time to uh, speak uh, on the details of the evidence we have, but still, I guess, I mean, two, two things I, I would like to quickly point out. Uh, back in 19, uh, 1815, uh, a letter from Lord Hastings, uh, dated June the 1st, what it says is, uh, the eastern boundary will be the Kali, which rises in the snowy mountains and pursues nearly a direct southerly course to the plains, where it assume, assumes the name of Bogra. That's one, and second, I want to like to read, uh, when uh, uh, Vutia uh, landlord of Kumao retained three villages of Kunji, Navi, and Kuti, and uh, then rulers of Nepal protested. And the letter that uh, uh, I would like to quote the letter, John Adams' letter, who was acting secretary at that time, he wrote a letter to Z.W. Trell, commissioner of Kumao, to surrender those villages to the regime of Nepal with a copy of letter to Edward Gardner and the resident commissioner of British India in Kathmandu then. So these are the issues when we, can, when we sit down and discuss, we can present our evidences, uh, India can present its evidences. So I mean, if, if the land belongs to us, it should stay with us. But if it does not belong to us, we're not asking for India's land to be included in Nepal. And the reason we did the constitutional amendment is we very feel, strongly feel this is our land and uh, we need to uh, get it back from India. But that's, uh, that's something that should be raised during negotiation. Another thing, uh, let me quickly point out, I was trying to fathom what roti beti relationship meant. I was not very clear because to me, uh, roti is not my staple. I mean, uh, a lot of people in the plains where I come from, uh, their staple is roti. But for me, dal bhat is a, a staple. To many Nepalese living in uh, uh, hills, mountains, and uh, uh, even uh, plains of the Nepal, uh, dal bhat is a regular staple. So, and then roti certainly is very important for you. And then I was thinking, uh, uh, beti, beti part is there. But then I was trying to find out why roti, roti, uh, this, this term comes. Then all of a sudden when I started hearing uh, uh, General Chakraborty, then I started realizing that back uh, in history, there was a time when we fought for India. When we fought for India, maybe the perception was uh, Gorkha mercenaries fought for Nepal, fought for India, and they are still being paid uh, handsomely uh, in terms of pensions until today. I guess if that's a perception, that perception has two things. I would say very strongly that if that perception is not going to change, Nepal might be a very small country, but we believe that the international relationship has to be has to be conducted on a sovereign equality basis. Uh, I very strongly and politely would like to assert that. Second thing, uh, which I saw in the, in, the, uh, in the chat box and also in the, in the pointers that were sent to us, citizenship for Indians marrying, uh, Indian women marrying a Nepali man. Nepal is trying to uh, amend the uh, law so that it becomes more difficult. She has to wait for seven years. It is, it is not just about Indians. My daughter-in-law is a Chinese-American. 
She has nothing to do with India. She has ne never even set her foot in India. But she also will have to wait for seven years to get the citizenship. And I am very strongly opposed to that. I think, I mean, culture, culture is very important. I very strongly support uh, that there has to be a way uh, for her to get the citizenship. You see, she wants to get the citizenship of Nepal. If she does not want, that's her choice. But I mean, tying anything Nepal does to, to bilateral relationship in, between Nepal and India and thinking that Nepal cannot think of uh, the best interests of Nepal and India, uh, as a, as a as old friend has to think for the best interest of India, Nepal, that perspective has to go away. And that's creating trouble. Uh, I, I guess I, I was a little blunt, but I just thought I mean, it would be good uh, that I bring it up so that I mean, perspective on both sides uh, uh, would be heard pretty well. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, sir. There's just a follow-up question, if you could just uh, be briefly uh, able to answer it. Uh, the question was about how would Nepal import low-value uh, bulk commodities using the Indian side of the territory in the event the border dispute deepens? Uh, could you provide your perspective? I would not even like to think that the border dispute will uh, uh, deepen to that level and then uh, uh, we'll see something of the sort that we saw uh, in 2015, uh, 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 to what I refer, we, we popularly uh, refer to as uh, India blockading Nepal. I cannot imagine that happening. If anybody is modeling that, that's something that uh, could be done. Uh, that's very unfortunate thinking. Okay. Um, Dr. Mehta, if I may, I would want to ask a very quick question to Ambassador Sood and uh, General Chakrabarti. And uh, in the interest of time, we've been getting quite a few interesting questions on the chat box. And one of them relates to the initial uh, framework that I was putting in. The aspiration of the modern Nepali states are different. There's a very large diaspora, at least 1 million people <coughs> of Nepali descent living in developed countries permanently. Um, and of course, we have migrant workers, which is another 4 or 5 million people. So in the last 10, 20, 30 years, things have changed. The way that the Nepalese think are not exactly with the way that maybe Mr. Pradhan and myself think. I also studied in India and Gujarat. It's like my second home. But the new generations kind of treat the world equally and they, are, they value the Indian relationship, but they also want to assert their kind of independence and uh, equality and justice. So from that perspective, uh, Ambassador Sood and uh, to Major General Chakrabarti, any any points of view that you have, you know these things like a palm of your head. Thank you. Well, you know, um, um, I think that uh, the uh, point has been made both by Dr. Pradhan and by Dr. Rishal uh, that Nepal has to be uh, treated uh, and, you know, with uh, equality and so on. And I don't think, I think General Chakravarti has also said that at no stage do we think of Nepal in any way other than as dealing with a sovereign equal nation. And if anything, you know, um, we have tried to be as uh, magnanimous or as generous. I mean, this is... Uh, we can go into uh, a lot of details about uh, um, various programs that we've done, etc., which continue to date. I mean, you know, 3,000 scholarships, uh, tens of millions of dollars on flood control and management and things like that, over 100 million, and in all kinds of things. I mean, we were the, even when the earthquake, unfortunate earthquake took place, I mean, uh, the largest contribution that was announced, which was uh, was by India of a billion dollars, 40% grant. I mean, so I don't think we have, other than being as as generous as we can be, we, I think, have, uh, there is no question, in my mind at least, that we would look at Nepal as a sovereign state and uh, respect its sovereignty. So having said that, um, I would say that uh, in terms of uh, looking at how we want to deal with fundamentals of the issue, I think when I was there, uh, you know, uh, I used to hear a lot of uh, 
misperceptions about the 1950 treaty. And 1950 is, one, is the first treaty that India is signed with Nepal. And this time it was an independent India and an independent Nepal, and we signed this treaty. And so I read the treaty. And uh, after that, I actually organized a three-day uh, conference among Nepalese and Indians just to discuss the 1950 treaty and to clear some of the misperceptions that have become so uh, prevalent between among the people that it is an unfair treaty, it is an unequal treaty, that it is a treaty that was imposed I can tell you, having gone through the history, that it was actually a treaty that the Nepalese regime sought. And they came, I mean, they sought it for the simple reason that uh, the Nepalese regime was extremely nervous at the Maoist revolution having taken place in China and the Chinese having come into Tibet. And they felt that they needed to solidify in their relationship with India. And that is how the 1950 treaty was done. And that's where the motivation came from. And it is actually a rehash of the 1923 treaty, which Nepal had with British India. And I think today, if we want to, uh, you know, if, if there is uh, a major change, Dr. Dikari, as you're talking about, and yes, uh, if the, then perhaps Nepal should come out and say how they want to, that fundamental treaty to be renegotiated. What should be the contours of that? I think it would be a good idea instead of, because I know this for a fact, and as I mentioned, when we actually come around to having official level talks, since the prime ministers on both sides have agreed for the more than 25 years now that we are ready to review and update. And incidentally, you know, we had a very similar treaty with Bhutan. It was signed in 1949. It was also called the Peace and Friendship Treaty with Bhutan. Now, obviously, the same changing demographics and all that. 2007, we reviewed and updated, and we signed the new 2007 Peace and Friendship Treaty with Bhutan. So it's, uh, you know, uh, from our side, I don't think there has been any reluctance on that score. Perhaps if we need to, we should relook at the fundamentals mm -hmm. and perhaps maybe when we start re looking at that uh, nepal can if the, if nepal feels that it has been treated with less than equal this thing i think it should all it will show up very clearly that actually the treaty has enormous privileges and advantages to nepali citizens because oh, the rights are extended or exercised not on a reciprocal basis, but on a non-reciprocal basis. And so we need to, but somehow the other, uh, it has, the reality hasn't come out. So maybe we need to have some conversations. And I think it is important that one thing that I feel about quite strongly is that we have had uh, close interactions at an official level, at a political level, but somehow at a people-to-people -people level, despite the fact that there is a certain um, relationship, a historical, religious, linguistic, cultural relationship. But nonetheless, there are certain uh, long-standing myths that have been generated which need to be dispelled. And I think it is important that we try and dispel those because this is what leads to that anti-Indian sentiment which creeps up from time to time. I remember when, um, you know, we all remember uh, some innocent comment. In fact, uh, General Chakravarti was saying in his first comment, he said, when he goes to Pokhara, he feels very much at home. I remember Madhuri Dixit actually once made that comment that when I go to Nepal, I, I feel as if I'm in India. And it led to an enormous controversy because he said that Madhuri Dixit is being expansionist. Now, <laughs> I'm quite sure she had no intention of being expansionist or taking over Nepal's territory. But <laughs> that, is how her, uh, that is how her statement was interpreted. So I think that, and why? Because there is the groundswell of an anti-Indian sentiment and then, you know, vested interests. And today it is a social, 
media dominated age so things get amplified echo chambers get created mm-hmm. tweets go viral and it reduces the space for reasoned discussion you know talking as reasonable people you have a difference let's talk about it let's try and sort it out but when you try to do these things through twitters and tweets and things like that then you know uh, you tend to polarize opinions and polarize positions and i think that is what is happening between india and nepal and somehow you know the tv channels was referred to i think this tv channels are a terrible thing uh, <laughs> for, <laughs> they run contrary to uh, any kind of uh, successful diplomacy i am afraid <laughs> thank you thank you so much ambassador so a lot of really good uh, uh, insights a uh, very quickly because we are running out of time very quickly to major general chakravarty i mean i appreciate all your points you i have lived in from nepal but i studied in india so five years and i have also lived in canada and the us sometimes there are perception in a smaller country of a little super sensitivity to a very large neighbors and uh, major general talked about the people to people relations which are going to be very important on this bill and it's not only on the individual level like uh, being a nepali i teach indian students here the relationship are different and then when i go to a indian teacher the relationship are different but on the state to state sometimes maybe there's a little bit of a extra sensitivity in a smaller country so maybe that's where it is coming from but we got to be more realistic as we also become more mature but uh, i would like to hear your opinion very briefly just in a couple minutes on how to build that state to state community relationship and give a perception of equal respect to the communities uh first thing i think i agree with the uh, ambassador sood that the 1950 treaty must be looked at and reviewed and we, let's come out with a new treaty so that both the countries can look into all these issues which you are saying and after all if that was done you know after india became independent so once you get that like we have done it with bhutan let's say with bangladesh we have today got the entire border issue resolved we are solving the tista river issue i mean say um, I, i'm sure dr pradhan would be knowing all these issues much better than what we do now the point is about the newer generation coming in and about the social media and all this well i must admire one thing we even in the indian army we are getting by the way there's no shortage of nepalese people joining us at the younger level both as officers at and also below officers rank some of the nepalese people are flying the indian air force aircraft you can imagine and uh, they are doing it very well but there is a sizable population which today has aspirations as you correctly said which cannot be fulfilled and they cannot be fulfilled in any country whether it's the united states whether it's china whether it's india these aspirations are not related to your and my generation they are related to younger thoughts and possibly as ambassador sud brought it the internet has come in in such a big way that the internet has caused a revolution of all affairs in the younger generation and everybody gets a crisp issue instead of going into details you try to make everything a fast food everything has been re- related to a hamburger or to a hot dog and you know the news has also got or issues also get you know what you call get into a sandwich issue so therefore it's important for us to allow more people to people contact i mean so there's no harm i think we should as uh, badr sud brought up we have a few scholarships we can increase the number of scholarships allow more students to come into our universities i think that and we also should send because you got today i was surprised my mother was not well and there was a nepalese cardiologist they are good pulmonologists don't think that they are only in the indian army as officers they are today engineers they are today building india's roads i think once they become engineers doctors and they and enter the mm-hmm. academic fields in a bigger way i think this perception would get correctly managed you can only manage it you cannot today mm-hmm. convince everybody well india is a the thing there will be always small little issues which will always <coughs> remain maybe we our generation was more sympathetic to each other and we could possibly take them in stride but definitely i think one way is we allow these things to happen and from our side 
we would do everything to make Nepalese people, particularly the younger generation, comfortable. I think one thing that struck me is you see today you have become a secular country, but all said and done, a sizable population of yours can visit our temples in big numbers and maybe we could create good accommodation for you to allow that to happen so that they feel happy. After all, the bulk of your population belong to one religion and then you got Buddhists also. We have lovely sites, so have you have Lumbini. We all go to Nepal and we go to the Pashupati Nath Mandir. So similarly, India could encourage you to come, go to Amarnath, to go to Badrinath and all these places. And maybe the younger generation would see how common we are when we visit these lovely sites. Also, your Muslims and Christians would come to our various places. Now that you are a secular country, it's very easy. I think as a matter of fact, now it's become very easy if we really start opening up with each other with an equality platform. That's all that is needed. Sir. Thank you so much, Major Chakrabarti. Very well said. Thank you so much. So given the interest of time, uh, Dr. Mehta, maybe you want to have one very quick uh, uh, remark maybe from Dr. Rizal, and then we can probably begin to close. We have lots of questions here, but I think we have time. So, yeah. can, can, can I quickly say something? Yes, sir. Yes, yes. Sir, please. Yeah. First, uh, I am a, one of the fiercest critic, critics of Prime Minister Oli. But when I hear some of the things said about him in India uh, from by Indian policymakers in some of the seminars, webinars uh, that I've been to, I, mean, I really feel bad that I mean, I, when Ra I do not, as a, as a citizen of Nepal, I would not say uh, about Prime Minister Modi, Modi what, what uh, opposition leader Rahul Gandhi says about him. That's not my right. I do respect uh, things that are domestic to India. And I would like to see that policymakers in India, when they say anything about Prime Minister Modi, they would not, they should not, uh, they would be ill-advised to the, uh, put the things the way I do. I mean, the, I, I'm a citizen of Nepal, I'm a member of opposition, uh, and my role is different from uh, uh, from uh, my very beloved friends and colleagues in India, uh, when they uh, and this would respect that uh, uh, parameter when they criticize Prime Minister Oli. Second, we have raised this issue, the border issue. I mean, this has to be resolved uh, through diplomatic means. But when we say that, and the way, uh, and when you assert that, please understand, we are not trying to undo everything that's bilateral between Nepal and India. The many things that will stay the way they, they have been in the past. But having said that, we cannot uh, just go uh, turn our uh, ears deep to the uh, uh, border issue that's there burning. And, uh, and uh, any Nepali would consider it to be very important, uh, uh, to, to, uh, important and of paramount significance to uh, our uh, nationhood. Great. Thank you so much, sir, for your. Uh, Thank you. Final Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, in the interest of time, I would uh, hold back my uh, comments. But uh, what is uh, uh, established is that uh, both countries should show their uh, mutual interest in the wonderful neighborly relation. And uh, we should sit down and uh, discuss the border uh, issues uh, with the evidences and have a logical conclusion to this. So without further ado, uh, thank you very much uh, to everyone. And I would now request uh, Dr. Arjun Kumar, uh, Director of Impact and Policy Research Institute and uh, Mr. Parshu Nepal, Director of International Development Institute, to formally come up and uh, give the vote of thanks. Uh, Dr. Arjun Kumar, over to you. Uh, shall I go first or Parshu sir should go? Yes, that's okay. Uh, Arjun, you can start. Okay, thank you. I'll just be very brief and uh, I would like Yes, I would like to propose a vote of thanks. And uh, 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 in this uncertain and challenging COVID-19 COVID times and under this monsoon weather, uh, the dynamic and excellent state of India-Nepal relations that are deep, uh, comprehensive and multifaceted uh, is faced with this uh, Kali River and border issues in the short terms. And uh, this uh, really calls for the need to further deepen bilateral relations for the benefit of the people of both our countries 
uh, our mutual commitment to work towards strengthening bilateral relation on the basis of uh, mutual trust, goodwill, mutual benefit uh, with regard to each other's aspirations, uh, sensitivities, and interests, uh, and also of the younger generation. Uh, thank you all. Uh, I would uh, like to very much thank uh, our uh, panelists, uh, Ambassador Rakesh uh, Sutsar, uh, 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 Dr. Minendra P. Rijal, sir, uh, Member of Parliament, Republic of Nepal, uh, Major General uh, Dr. P. K. Chakravarti, sir, thank you, sir, very much, and uh, uh, Mr. Ajay Pradhan, uh, uh, Senior Policy Advisor uh, at the uh, Government of Canada. And uh, I would also like to thank our moderators, Dr. Simi Mehta from Impri and uh, Dr. Ambika P. Adhikari, sir, uh, from City of uh, Tempe, Arizona, Principal Planner. And uh, I would uh, also uh, like to thank our, uh, our partner, International Development Institute, uh, for organizing, organizing this uh, excellent talk. And uh, the, this is the real and uh, academic kind of partnership and platform uh, both of our organization uh, is trying to learn from your experience. It is vast experience and history and all the facets uh, which the light you have shed. Uh, it's really very uh, heartening and, and, and enlightening. And thank you very much. Uh, I would now also uh, invite Parshu sir, director, IDI, uh, to have the closing words. Sir, please. Uh, thank you, Arjuna. Well, I think uh, many things uh, has been said already, and I don't want to repeat uh, things, uh, you know, in the essence of time, but I sincerely would like to thank uh, our partners, uh, uh, especially Impri uh, and uh, all, the, all the panelists and the moderators, you know, uh, Ambika Dai and the CB. Uh, I would like to uh, thank uh, for carrying out this uh, uh, important uh, discussion. And uh, I, we hope to have uh, this kind of uh, discourse uh, in uh, coming uh, weeks and months as well. Uh, I, I thank you, uh, all the panelists and, and the viewers uh, for the uh, interest uh, and participating in this program. Uh, thank you. So before we uh, just sign off, uh, can we uh, have everyone uh, turned on their uh, video so that I can just take a quick uh, group photograph? Yes, thank you. Suman uh, sir, yes. There we go. One, two, three. One, two. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good evening and have a very good, good evening. Thank, thank you so much. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.